Oh, hello. I was just reading some in the Bible. Do you read your Bible? Do you understand what you read? Sometimes we need people to help guide us through what the Bible is saying to us. And today we're going to talk about one of those figures, someone who's been very important in my life, helping me understand what the Bible is saying to me, and I think can help you understand what the Bible is saying to you. A man named N.T. Wright, who is a biblical scholar, but more importantly, he's a committed Christian who has a love for the church and a love for God and for Jesus, and is writing to help people grow in their love for God and Jesus. My name is Murray Richmond. I'm pastor of the First Presbyterian Church here in Medford, and it's so good to be with you this morning. I'm glad you've invited us into our homes, and my prayer is that this service be a blessing for you. Amen. Let us join our hearts in the call to worship. Jesus comes alongside us and calls us by name, saying, Follow me. A simple call, a hard call, because following requires leaving. We look around to see who else Jesus could be talking to. And we look around to see the trappings of life we know. It's hard to leave our nets and walk away from the lake. But we have come this far, to this place, where we can listen to and be transformed. first reading is from the book of Isaiah, the eighth chapter, verses three through eight. A voice cries out, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. 
Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and their constancy is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. gospel text today comes to us from Matthew, uh, Matthew 4. It's the story of Jesus' temptation. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was finished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When I get to heaven, I have a few questions for God. Like, 
why mosquitoes? Were they really necessary? Did you really need to do that? Another one, a more serious issue, is if the Bible is so central to our faith, then why is it so confusing? You know, the two texts that we heard today are about the importance of the Word of God in our lives. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of God will stand forever. And in Matthew, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. If the Scriptures are so important to us, then why are they so confusing? One way Frederick Beatner wrote of the Bible, one way to describe the Bible written by many different people over a period of 3,000 years and more would be to say that it is a disorderly collection of 60-odd books which are often tedious, barbaric, obscure, and teemed with contradictions and inconsistencies. It's a swarming compost of a book, an Irish stew of poetry and propaganda, law and legalism, myth and murk, history and hysteria. Over the centuries, it has become hopelessly associated with tub-thumping evangelism and dreary piety with a superannuated superstition and blue-nosed moralizing with ecclesiastical authoritarianism and crippling literalism. Let them who try to start at Genesis and work their way conscientiously to Revelation, let them beware. And he's right. The Bible is, in many ways, very confusing. But I can guess what part of God's answer is going to be if I were to ask him that, and that was, I gave you people to help you understand it better. One of those people in the subject of today's sermon is a New Testament professor by the name of N.T. Wright. He has been a shining light, light post in my quest to understand the Bible better. But before we get to write, I want to give us some background on the Bible itself. You know, knowing where the Bible comes from can help us understand what it is and perhaps what it isn't saying to us. Now, I, I think many of us are tempted to think that the Bible just came down to us, King James Version, black pebbled leather cover and all the words of Jesus in red. No, that is not how that happened. Oh, we think that Matthew finished his gospel, mailed it to a publisher who then saw that it was worth something and added it to the Old Testament, which was already a bestseller. And Mark, Luke, and John all saw his success, so they wrote gospels and sent them to the same editor who in turn added the book of the New Testament to the Bible with Matthew and thereby invented the whole New Testament. And when Paul saw their success, he submitted some letters he had written and they were accepted and so on and so forth. That's not how the New Testament came into being. It was more like this. We start with the oral tradition. Now, you may ask yourself, you know, people who sat and listened to the sermons of Jesus, the, speak, the speaking of Jesus, and did not have paper to write on or, or an easy ink to use, they didn't have ballpoint pens and legal pads or anything like that, how did they remember what Jesus said? Can we trust him? Can we trust what they said? Well, the Jews who followed Jesus, the disciples, lived in a world where the oral tradition was almost, if not more important, than the written word. Most people could not read, and so they memorized. And the stories of Jesus were passed around orally until a few people started writing them down for their community. There was a community who learned about Jesus primarily, for instance, through the Gospel of Matthew. And Matthew drew from works from Mark and Luke, and Luke and Mark drew from Matthew and vice versa. Um, and John's a whole different animal. But you had these, the, the, the early disciples would learn the speech of Jesus because when you live in a pre-literate society uh, or you're not part of a literate society, you do a lot of memorizing. Plus, Jesus gave his sermons in such ways that people could understand them better. And the stories are told in such ways that people could understand and could remember them and tell them. And there was a fixed way of doing the oral tradition. If you violated that, then, then everybody knew. It's kind of like when you read Green Eggs and Ham to your kid for the 115th time and you decided to 
spice it up a little bit by adding new elements and stuff like that and your kid goes that's not the way it goes they know how it goes they know how it goes so there were oral traditions about Jesus that ended up in different communities each community had its own storyteller about the life of Jesus and eventually these stories were written down now each gospel has uh, a name attributed to it Matthew Mark Luke and John but it doesn't say actually in the text that they were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This was the oral tradition that came down from, and we're not sure who, but the, there are the names given to the Gospels. Luke is fairly consistent. We're pretty sure Luke wrote the book of Luke because he later, he also writes Acts and he refers to the previous book, uh, in the book of Acts, and so we think Luke did. We don't really know who wrote John. We believe it was the beloved disciple is a phrase John uses for one of his disciples, and we believe that disciple was John, and so he uses that phrase without ever naming John, and so maybe John wrote John. That was the reasoning they came up with. And in Matthew, he is adamant that we know that he was the tax collector, um, but it's not like he signed it. Also, it's not like he wrote it down and got it published right away. Um, there wasn't a lot of publishing in those days. So it was written on a scroll. And the scroll was memorized by many people. It would be read aloud in worship services and memorized by the people who listened to it. You know, when we listen to Scripture, we kind of listen to it. But when Scripture was read for the early church... They worked on memorizing it so they knew what it said. Um, what, and as it was written down, copies were written down. And we don't have the original manuscript that Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, the Peter, any of the people who wrote books in the Bible, we don't have their original manuscripts. We have copies of copies of copies of copies of copies of copies. Um, now, if you've ever played the game, we called it gossip when I was a kid. Some people call it telephone, where you say a phrase in someone's ear, you know, strangers in the night, and it comes out to you like nighttime is the bright time uh, because it's got garbled on, along the way. It didn't happen like that. They were writing these down, and they were copying manuscripts down. So they could, if, if, if you gave the phrase strangers in the night and wrote it down on a piece of paper, gave it to the person next to you, and they had to write it down and give it to the next person, you'd probably get strangers in the night at the very end. They were very meticulous, and the Word of God was very important to them. Um, now, there were more Gospels than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John floating around at that time. There was, for instance, the Gospel of Thomas. And Thomas is known for Jesus making clay pigeons and blowing on them when he was a kid and they would come alive. At the end of the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus is talking about important things about the kingdom of God. And Peter says, Jesus, you can't talk about this now. Mary's here and she's a woman and she cannot partake of the things of the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, oh, Peter, you are wrong. For I have made Mary a man so she can perceive things of the kingdom of God. There's a gospel of Peter. And part of it, Peter's sitting on a hill watching the crucifixion. And Jesus appears to him and says to Peter, You see that man down there that's dying? That's not me. That's someone else. You can't kill God. You killed the human part, but you can't kill God. You can't kill me. I never died. If he never died, then how was he, you know, why would he be, have to be resurrected? You know, we believe that in traditional belief says that Jesus died body, mind, and soul. And that soul was part of who he was as the Son of God. And so he died. So after a while, with all these different gospels running around and different letters that were supposedly written by apostles, some of them obviously fake. Others a little less, uh, and a little less fake, and perhaps real. The uh, eventually the church decided that they needed a canon, C A N O N, and a canon is 
the basically the reception of certain texts and only these texts will be included in this collection. So they talk about, for instance, the canon of English literature and people argue about if you were to read the best writing in English literature, who would be in that canon? Well, in the early church, they did the canon of Matthew of the New Testament. And there are several attempts at it. Uh, it w- really wasn't until the year 350 that they get the 27 books that we have now. Um, and they were codified in the, at the Council of Hippo in 393. So it's a long time between the time that um, uh, Jesus did his ministry until the time when it is all written down and codified as what we call the Bible now. Uh, that doesn't mean that those weren't used before. Uh, Matthew was very popular. Luke was very popular. They took the text that people were using essentially, and those became part of the canon. And when those became part of the canon, they looked at what other gospels were teaching and if they didn't line up with what Matthew, Mark, Luke and John were saying then they didn't make the cut. They had a canon of Paul's letters and you know these are the letters that got into the Bible. Paul probably wrote many many other letters and many of them probably disappeared. Some of them might have resurfaced. We don't know we don't know really but the letters that were chosen for the canon of scripture were the ones that needed to be dealt with in Scripture. Um, And interestingly enough, when they were coming up for critiques of what gets in the canon, what's our criteria, uh, it was based more on the fact that it was written by an apostle or one of their close associates rather than claims of divine inspiration. For all the books had claims of divine inspiration. And yet, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the only Gospels to get the nod. Paul's letters, the letters of Peter, the letters of Jude, etc., those were the ones to get the nod because they were supposedly written by apostles. Um, And in terms of how this came down to the Protestant church, it wasn't until um, uh, 1545 that the canon was established for, um, for Protestants. But they had been using this for ages before. These were, the, these were the received texts of the New Testament, and everybody agreed on them. So that's where the Bible came from. For me, one of the best people to help guide me through the Scriptures is a man named N.T. Wright, Nicholas Thomas Wright, born in December 1948. He was an English New Testament scholar, a Pauline theologian, and an Anglican bishop. He was the bishop of Durham, Durham, not Durham, North Carolina, but Durham, England, from 2003 to 2010. He became a researcher of the New Testament and early Christianity at St. Mary's College at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, and then he has, he's currently serving as a senior research fellow in Wycliffe Hall at the University of Oxford. He's written over 70 books. But the ones that stand out the most are his New Testament and the people of God. This is the introductory volume that he wrote. And this is just to give us a basic introduction to the New Testament. After that, he did a volume on Jesus. As we see here... It's a bit thicker than the other one. I don't know if you can tell that, but it's a bit thicker. And it, I, I remember waiting for it to come out, and it kept getting delayed and delayed and delayed, and I was wondering why. And I read somewhere that he was trying to write the resurrection part as the final chapter to his story on Jesus, Jesus and the victory of God. And finally his publisher said, we can't wait anymore You've got to publish what you've got. Work on your resurrection book later, and we can publish that as an addendum to the book. So he worked on the resurrection. He had the first part published, and then he worked on the resurrection, which was this book, very, very thick, thicker than his volume on Jesus. And then he turned his sights on Paul. 
Okay, that looks like a fairly easy, you know, not, not a huge book to read, at least not if you're an academic, but this is the first volume of it. So all these books here are books that N.T. Wright wrote that are supposed to help us understand the Bible better. In his book, How God Became King, The Forgotten Story of the Gospels, Wright was critical of some ideas concerning the historical Jesus um, in both U.S. evangelical preaching, and he summarizes his critique. One of the targets of this book is Christians who say, yes, the Bible is true, it's inerrant, and so on. But then they pay no attention to what the Bible actually says. They're more concerned about their theology about the Bible than they are what's found in the Bible. He goes on to say, too many Christians, it seems sufficient to say Christ was born in a virgin, born of a virgin, died on a cross, and was resurrected. But what did he do in between? I'm N.T. Wright goes on to say, I'm saying that's not the way to understand the Gospels. He posed the question to a group of evangelical students, why did Jesus die? And they all came up with what most people would say the right answer, Jesus died for our sins. And then he followed up with a question, why did Jesus live? If all he had to do to save us was die, why didn't he just die as a young kid? Or, you know, why did he have to do all the preaching and teaching and stuff like that? Um, what Jesus' life was as important as his death and resurrection. He wrote his books on Paul because he was seeing that he was not happy with the way other scholars were handling Paul. As he writes, Paul has come to be abused, misunderstood, imposed upon, and approached with incorrect or inappropriate questions about the Christian faith. He went on to say, Paul in the 20th century then has been used and abused as much in the first. Can we, as the century draws its close, listen a bit more closely to him? Can we somehow repent in the ways that we have mishandled Paul and respect his own way of doing things a bit more? One of the ways that N.T. Wright listens differently to Paul is he takes Paul's Jewishness very seriously, as he does with Jesus as well. Um, although Paul is known as the architect of Christianity, Wright does a lot to place him within both the Roman context of his day, which most New Testament scholars do, but as well with the Jewish concepts of his day. And, and those are very important. If we understand what Judaism was about in the first century, we can understand more about what people were saying. For instance, Jesus talks about the end times. And when he's coming again, and most people think of that as that's when the world's going to end. You know, God's going to get rid of everybody and all the Christians get to go to heaven and all those that aren't Christians don't. Um, but what the Jews expected was very different than what Christians expect. The end times was not the end of the world. It was the end of the world as they knew it. The world was going to be changed. It was going to be transformed in such a way that if we see it now, we wouldn't understand it. But when Jesus comes again, then there's a sense where we gather around and we become what we've always supposed to have been, members of the kingdom of God. And we take seriously what Jesus taught and said. And other considerations don't come before that. For Jesus, that is what the end times were about. Not the end of the world, just the end of the world as we know it. Wright uses his extensive research on first century Judaism to help show us the worldview of Jesus. He says about Jesus' resurrection, Jesus' resurrection is the beginning of God's new project, not to snatch people away from earth to heaven, but to colonize earth with the life of heaven. That is, after all, what the Lord's Prayer is about. N.T. Wright wants us to get into the biblical worldview of the first century Jews and Christians. He wants us to understand them, and he's done a lot 
of research in that area, has lived in Israel and studied the customs of the first century. Um, and the worldview, if we can get more into the worldview of Jesus, then we can understand the kingdom better. The resurrection, he says, completes the inauguration of God's kingdom. It is a decisive event demonstrating that God's kingdom really has been launched on earth as it has been in heaven. Now, the thing I like most about N.T. Wright is while he does write for the academy, and, and frankly, these books probably aren't for too many lay people. Um, it takes a lot of background and understanding of the New Testament. He did write many books for lay people, though. Um, but these are for the academy. But at the same time, they're for the church. They're for pastors. They're for people who want to understand the Bible more and are willing to put the time and effort it takes to do so. Here his, is his overarching goal for his work. Our task as image-bearing, God-loving, Christ-shaped, spirit-filled Christians following Christ and shaping our world is to announce redemption to a world that has discovered its fallenness, to announce healing to a world that has discovered its brokenness, to proclaim love and trust to a world that knows only exploitation, fear, and suspicion. The gospel of Jesus points us and indeed urges us to be at the leading edge of the whole culture, articulating in story and music and art and philosophy and education, poetry and politics and theology and even, God help us, biblical studies, a worldview that will mount the historically rooted Christian challenge to both modernity and postmodernity leading the way with joy and humor and gentleness and good judgment and true wisdom. N.T. Wright has those things he's talking about. Joy, humor, gentleness, good judgment, and true wisdom. The message of Easter, he says, is that God's new world has been unveiled in Jesus Christ and now we're invited to become a part of it. At the beginning of the sermon, I quoted Frederick Buechner on the Bible and how confusing it is. But Buechner did not stop there. He went on to write why we should read the Bible. And he, in the second part of his essay, he says, And yet, just because it is a book about both the sublime and the unspeakable, it is also a book about life the way it really is. The Bible is a book about people who at one and the same time can be both believing and unbelieving, innocent and guilty, crusaders and crooks, full of hope and full of despair. In other words, he says, it's a book about us. And it is also a book about God. If it is not about the God we believe in, then it is about a God we do not believe in. One way or another, the story we find in the Bible is our own story. And in my life, I have found that N.T. Wright was one of the best guides to help me and find myself in that story. Please join me in prayer. Oh, Lord, our God, we thank you for the scriptures. And even though they can be confusing at times, even though they can be hard to understand at times, even though they're misused by a lot of people for a lot of wrong things, we do thank you for this book, which does tell us who we are and what we're about. It tells us who you are and what you're about. It tells us about who Jesus was and what Jesus was about. And may we understand that we are part of the kingdom of God. May we continue to be more faithful citizens of your kingdom and that everything we do stems from your teachings and your love and your grace. Be with us, Jesus, as we struggle with the scriptures. Be with us as we misunderstand them and help us to understand them better. Be with us as we're comforted by the word of God. Be with us as it changes our lives and makes us better people. One of the things you talked about was love, and in loving we care for other people. And now we're going to show our care for them by praying for them. Lord, we continue to pray for the Snyder family, for Ryan and Jamie and their children on the death of Ryan's father. 
as the plans are being made for a memorial service that will require a lot of travel. We just lift them up to you. We continue to pray for our child care center. We thank you, Lord, for the for the parents of the children who have shown patience and support that we have this opportunity to serve this community as we have for many, many years. Lord, as new fires break out after weeks of wildfire, we ask for strength and endurance for the people fighting those fires. Some of them have been doing it for a month now or more. We pray for those who are impacted by the death of loved ones. We pray for those, Lord, whose loved ones suffer from addiction or mental illness. We continue, Lord, to pray for the healing of our nation. We thank you that Elizabeth's shoulder surgery went well, that she's back home and recovering. We thank you that after Harold was, Harold Sudmeyer was discharged from the hospital, he's doing really, really well, Lord, at Avamir, able to get out sometimes and take care of this business. We thank you for all of the healing that you brought to the many requests that we've made in the past. We want to pause and just think of the prayers we've we've prayed and the healing and the comfort that you've given in answer. All of these we lift up to you, Lord, in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray. Our Father, Father who, who art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be, be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God has given so generously to us through people like N.T. Wright who teach us about the Bible and what it's saying and how we can better live as citizens of the kingdom of God. God has given in abundance to us. Now is the time for me to ask, what are you going to give back to God? I'm not just hawking up money for the church itself. I'm asking, what are you going to do in your heart of hearts with what God has done for you. If you want to give money to this congregation, then there's ways to do that. You can go online and do it. You can mail us a check. Uh, you can even call in and give us a credit card payment. We can do that, although not until Elizabeth is back in the office. Um, however it is, and whatever you decide to do, be generous in your response to God's generous love to you. Oh, Lord, you said you love a cheerful giver. Help us to be cheerful givers, basking in your grace and in your love. In Jesus' name, amen. In some ways, the scriptures are like a map, but it's a map where we often, it's not as precise as we want it to be. Instead of saying, go three blocks, turn left, go one block, turn right, it says, Go in that direction. There's a lot of ambiguity in there. But then there are a lot of things that are really plain and clear. Love your enemies. Love God. Love others. Love yourself. May we live the life that the Bible teaches us to live. And may the love of God fall upon you like a soft summer rain. May the grace of Jesus surround you like the air you breathe, and may the power of the Holy Spirit work in and through you now and evermore. Amen.